to something that I think will hopefully be restorative for us. So I'll pass it over to Jen. All right. Um, hi, all, all of you seniors. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Jen. I'm an R3 in our program. Uh, and today I wanted to take some time to talk about art and medicine. Please let me know at any point if my screens go wonk or if my screen goes wonky. Um, yep, yeah, for example, there we go. Um, so when I was playing my academic half day, I knew I would be coming after a couple hours of pretty dense mix app learning. Um, so I wanted to take this time to do something that's a little non-traditional. Um, so we are going to be talking about and looking at artwork today and sharing our thoughts. It's going to require some buy-in and participation from everybody. Um, so either chat or unmute yourself uh, at any point during the talk. Um, I'm just asking for your trust and help making sure that this remains a safe space for everybody so that we can all share freely. Um, and I want to, encourage, to assure you that this is a very low pressure, low stakes talk. Um, and I really think that you'll enjoy it. So with that in mind, um, we'll ease into this with a short silent task. So no need to unmute yourself or chat your answers. I just want you to make a mental note of where in this CT scan you see the lung nodule. Here's our CT scan. It is not hard to find. You probably can tell that in the bottom left of our screen, there's a lung nodule. Quick question for everybody. How many of you saw the gorilla? <laughs> here's our CT scan again, and here's our gorilla. Um, and I know that um, I probably didn't trick any, all of you, but I hope that I tricked some of you um, because you're good test takers and you knew that there was something else up when I asked you to look at a CT scan. Um, but this is an example of how once people see what they think they're supposed to see, they often stop looking at the rest of this, at the rest of what they're looking at. And it's really easy to miss things when you're not looking for them. Um, so this phenomenon, oh, hold on. There we go, is called inattentional blindness. Um, it is best known from a 1999 study called Gorillas in Our Midst, otherwise known as the Invisible Gorilla Study, uh, in which observers were asked to watch a video of uh, basketball players passing a basketball back and forth. And halfway through this, the video, a, a person in a gorilla suit walks through, stands in the middle, thumps their chest, and then walks off. And in that study, 50% of all observers missed the gorilla. Um, I did not want to try and load a video and make us watch it on Zoom together, but I highly recommend that you watch it and try and trick your friends and families because it's quite enjoyable. So then the next question that was asked was, are experts, people who have been highly trained in the primary task that they're um, performing any better at this? And are they still vulnerable to this selective inattention? So the second study I wanted to talk about is called Invisible Gorilla Strikes Again. Um, and in this study, 24 radiologists at Harvard were asked to perform a lung nodule detection task. And in the last case, a gorilla was inserted into the frame, as we saw. It is 48 times larger than the average nodule and increased in opacity from 50% to 100 and then back down to 50% over the course of five frames. Um, and the maximum opacity not of the gorilla was centered over the lung nodule such that both of them were equally visible um, at the same time. And the results showed that um, 20 out of the 24 radiologists or 83% of them did not see the gorilla. This is in comparison to 100% of naive observers who got a short training on nodule um, detection and 100% of them missed the gorilla. This figure here in the center shows that the nodule detection task was quite challenging, um, but radiologists were still better than naive observers. And this final figure just proves that the gorilla was in fact visible when people were cued to look for it or if they were told, um, do you see the gorilla in this picture? The thing that I find particularly interesting about this is that of the 20 radiologists who reported that they did not see the gorilla, 12 of them looked directly at it. So here we have our CT again with the embedded gorilla, which I personally will never not enjoy looking at. Um, and here we have an eye position plot of one of the radiologists who reported that they did not see the gorilla. 
And each of these blue circles represents eye position for one millisecond. And I just find it particularly interesting that they looked directly at this, not at this gorilla for clearly some significant amount of time, um, but consciously did not like filed it away as not relevant to their task or unconsciously filed it away, I suppose. So then the next question that we ask ourselves is how can we mitigate this? Um, how can we acknowledge that this is happening and um, be better? And I'd like to introduce one strategy, um, which is just to acknowledge that observation and attention to detail are learned skills that we pick up um, with practice and time, but we aren't always explicitly taught how to do this especially in the medical field. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the concept of visual thinking strategies. Uh, Matt is men mentioning the chest x-ray reading system, uh, which I think is an excellent medical um, version of this. Um, and I'm gonna take that and pivot into the world of artwork. Um, so visual thinking strategies is a educational curriculum originally designed for the K-12 level in the 1980s that used trained facilitators to guide a group of trainees through a systematic approach to viewing artwork and discussing it with the goal of increasing critical thinking, visual, visual literacy and communication skills and teamwork. Um, students were encouraged to share their observations, listen to each other and then scaffold off of each other as a team. Um, this concept was introduced to medical education in 1998 at the Yale School of Medicine by a dermatologist and um, museum curator. And um, there is a growing body of evidence that shows that visual arts training in particular in medicine and healthcare professions measurably increases observation, situational awareness, um, both the quantity and quality of descriptive language, analytical tools, um, and interestingly, but not surprisingly, tolerance of ambiguity, empathy, and well being. Um, there are a lot of uh, paintings that can contain ambiguous or contradictory information. And when students are asked to critically analyze and discuss this and provide possible explanations or solutions, um, it kind of mimics your patient that comes in with unexplained symptoms that um, are ambiguous and could mean many different things. Um, there's clear. There is evidence that even short exposure to a visual thinking strategies curriculum um, has a significant impact for students. Um, in one study, there were first year medical students in Miami who received a visual thinking strategies curriculum and they spent more time analyzing clinical images, um, used more words to describe what they saw and had an increased number of clinically relevant observations when compared to a group of first year medical students who did not get this training. Um, so with that in mind, the rest of the study or the rest of this um, presentation is going to be us looking at some artwork, discussing it as a group, either in chat or please unmute yourself. Um, and the goal for today is going to be to try and diagnose the canvas. Our, our objectives are to hone our observation skills, practice descriptive language and teamwork, test our critical thinking and visual diagnosis, and hopefully have a little bit of fun, a little bit of a break from um, all medicine all the time. I don't have any disclosures for this talk, but I do wanna acknowledge two things. First is that we're going to be looking at artwork that's predominantly composed of paintings that were painted by and of white European men, which is just a byproduct of the fact that there's a limited number of high quality images that combine medicine and art have been discussed in the literature and are available for open source use online. So that's just one disclosure. And second is that while I'm interested in this topic, I'm certainly not an expert. So I will happily facilitate, provide my own observations and keep things moving, but it's by no means a comprehensive um, observation of this artwork. So I'm here to learn from you as much as I am to provide teaching. And it's gonna be a bit of a Zoom experiment. So please keep an open mind and an adventurous spirit as we get started. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this one's somewhat of an obvious one. Um, chat or unmute yourselves and share what you see. What's going on in this picture? Hillary says tetanus and Nick Bedore says suffering, um, which I agree with. What do you see that makes you say that? Uh, 
think the the setting is kind of interesting. This like uncovered mattress. It looks like almost, and the pay, the the person's facial expression looks incredibly like locked in and in pain in the way that they're kind of gripping their forearms and arching their back and clawing their foot. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm seeing in the chat that people have seen this piece of artwork before, which is why I chose to start with it. Um, and that it is a, a really good example of a severe manifestation of a disease that we have treatment and prevention for now. Um, but Nick, I absolutely agree with you. He looks like, this person looks like they are in pain and really suffering. Um, does anybody have anything else that they can find, anything else that they want to share? I can share some. I don't know if this is. Oh, sorry. But that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Other um, Nick. I've, I've seen this picture many times as well. Um, and I always appreciate getting a chance to, to look at it in a new light. I, I think that um, what I noticed this time is that uh, that you're like you're not actually looking at this person's face, like they're kind of looking in a different direction. So it's like, it, and the fact that they're completely naked, it's like kind of it's like very intimate, but also like impersonal at the same time for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like like someone who's like over medicalized uh, or, or, you know, like, it's like, it's not really like, it, it's like a very touching intense picture, but um, uh, not very personal at the same time. Thank you for sharing that. Matt Cataldo says loss of patient dignity, um, which is, I think dovetails nicely with what Nick was saying. Absolutely. I don't think it will surprise anybody to learn that this painting is called Tetanus Following Gunshot Wounds. Um, and this is a artistic representation of Episthotonus, which here um, is seen in a patient. Uh, it is spasm of the muscles causing rigidity and backward arching of the head, neck, and spine. Um, and just as we see in this painting, if the patient is lying on their back, only the heels of their feet and their head tends to touch whatever surface they're laying on. Um, and just to pepper in some medical knowledge so I don't get in trouble with Shree um, and make sure that this is deserving of our senior curriculum, uh, I will just share that while there are many, there are many causes of this and while tetanus is certain, severe tetanus is certainly one of them, this can occur with rabies, certain kinds of meningoencephalitis and um, strychnine poisoning. So fun fact there. Moving on here, this is our next painting. It's called An Old Man and His Grandson. What is going on in this picture? I see an old man looking at what I'm assuming is their grandson. Does anybody have any other observations to share? Yeah, Shri says his nose, which we can definitely um, zoom in on. Um, even without knowing what it's called, Shri, do you have like a way to describe what you're seeing just using descriptive language? Yeah, it looks really big. Um, there's some nodules on it. Um, maybe he says he looks a little sallow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Are there other skin findings that people are seeing beyond just like the obvious one that draws you in? I'm seeing one on the right forehead. And then maybe something along the right temple as well. Yeah. This one here, I think you're pointing out, Francisco. Yeah. Uh-huh. That one. Yeah. 
I think he also looks a little, and again, it could be just my computer, but the, the skin tone is different than his grandson. And so I'm like, is he yellower than his grandson? Is he not yellower than his grandson? Don't actually know. Yeah. And I don't have a perfect answer for you, right? Is this normal skin tone and this person is pale or is this normal skin tone and this um, grandson is, or grandfather is more yellow? There's, there's a lot of ambiguity. Hillary says, where are they located? She likes the trees and mountains. Thanks for bringing us outside of the, like looking at skin tones and noses, this beautiful um, window or possibly portrait in the background. Um, all, we, all we can tell is that there's a frame here. What kind of outfit is that? Like that he's wearing and the kid is wearing. It looks like he's wearing like a hairy bolo. <laughs> it does. I think that's just his chest hair. <laughs> That's protruding from his garment. Peeking through. It's a lot of just her. <laughs> uh, I love the like super just loving, innocent face of the grandson as he's yeah. looking up or whoever this child is. Yeah. Uh, kind of looks worried. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, like, is this a change that happened suddenly? Doesn't seem to be bothering the grandson. Maybe this is how his grandfather has always looked. We don't know. I do think it, it seems like the artist is really trying to make a pretty stark contrast between like the very smooth, like rosy cheek of the little kid and then his grandfather. And it seems like he's using like the skin as his way of sort of like showing aging and just like the the passage of time and how aging can be a, a hard process. Yeah, that dichotomy of like youthful, yeah. innocent age um, and time. Absolutely. Um, there's some mention in the chat of the grandson's hand with very long fingers here. It's so hard to paint hands, so hard to paint anything. I'm not an artist, um, but um, Yes, you guys were like right on the money here. This is what's called rhinophyma. Um, Lynette says, the nose reminds me of leprosy nodules. Uh, and I will say this is a little bit of speculation on my part. There's some evidence, you know, in the literature uh, that would support this being rhinophyma, which is, as we dis discussed, it's an enlarged red, bumpy and bulbous nose. Uh, and it is the result of severe untreated rosacea. So you guys were right. Um, treated with surgery, uh, cautery, and or lasers these days, but um, you know, not a great treatment back when this painting would have been painted. All right, next painting, possibly. Oh, excuse me. Here we go. This painting is called "An Old Woman or the Ugly Duchess." What's going on in this picture? It's better to be the first person to talk because you can just say, I see a, a woman in this painting who's looking off to the side. Um, I'm not sure Dr. Cho when this was painted. I could look it up, uh, but I don't have it in my notes. Yeah, Mike and Mindy are noticing the bold forehead and wondering if this could represent acromegaly. What else do you see? Oh, thanks Erica. But yours look pretty large as well. Yeah. Very broad neck and shoulders. Yeah. Possibly a swan neck deformity. Duncan says elongated philtrum. What about this person's hands? In proportion to the rest of the abnormalities we're seeing. They're big. Yeah. I don't know, to me, these hands look like a lot more, for lack of a better word, feminine and like not as um, deformed, I suppose, compared to the face. Hillary says very pow powerful corset, absolutely. 
elegant dress and interesting headwear. Shri, what can we maybe deduce about this person based on the outfit that they're wearing? Maybe they're of a higher social class. Yeah, fancy person, absolutely. What if I told you that this was a painting that was very lovingly painted um, and would have cost quite a bit of money for the subject of the painting to be, uh, to hire an artist to do this? Does that change what you think about it? Or not? I love how, um, uh, like, uh, given that context, how like kind of uh, like realistic or like true, uh, it, how true it feels because of all these kind of imperfections and things that they included. Uh, nowadays, it would be like totally photoshopped or have a filter or whatever. So it's kind of a it's a it's a interesting contrast to our modern times. Yeah, yeah. There was thought. There's a lot of discussion about this painting in the literature. Um, and at one point it was thought that maybe this just was like a satirical representation of like the upper class and women who are trying to be young beyond their years, but more recent art history evidence that I won't go into has suggested that this is actually an accurate representation of what the subject of this painting looked like. There are many portraits of her that look the same. It does not seem like it's, you know, a one-off by a painter who was angry with this person. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, the leading theory is that this re represents Paget's disease of the bone. And here's a photo of a real person who um, had similar facial deformities or, you know, a different facial deformity. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate everything you guys have to share. Anything else to share before we move on? Thanks for sharing that, Jen, because I, 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 was, I was wondering if like this was trying to be a caricature, and that's actually, it really does change the way I was sort of thinking of it, and that's really interesting context. Yeah, yeah, and interestingly, um, there, this, this is something that there's been a lot of discussion for, so I, if you search Ugly Duchess, you can find any number of studies and articles talking about it, but I just find it really interesting. Uh, we can move on to our next portrait to look at. Um, this is a portrait of a real person named Gerard de Lares, possibly, if I can pronounce it correctly. Uh, what's going on in this picture? They get harder. Kim says, is he hiding his hand? His stomach hurts, anemia. I love it. You guys are jumping to like the, like what could be the diagnosis. And I would recommend just like even step back and say, what do we even see in this painting? Looks pale, can't tell if he's young or just the style. Yeah, so he's holding a paper in his hand, very light skin compared to his background, big hands compared to the head. Absolutely. This one is harder. A very casual pose. Like he was just reading this, this page. And it kind of looks up or whatever. <laughs> kind yeah. of like it obviously takes like hours and hours to paint the painting, but I always love when it's kind of like in a um, uh, like candid style or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mindy says something sad about his face. Uh, not to call you out, Mindy, but anything else to add there? I don't know. It's just something about his eyes. They just look like they're like a little haunting or a little sad looking to me. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Erica says broad navel, nasal bridge and Seth says face looks like a skull. Absolutely. Um, so if I put this up, does that help anybody? Is it syphilis? Late stages of syphilis? It's congenital syphilis. So this, the subject of this painting, it was a Dutch Baroque painter who was known to have congenital syphilis and went blind at the age of 49. So I think the like haunting eyes or just like 
facial expression is um, something that we don't see a lot and um, maybe you don't have the words to describe anymore, but you guys are all picking up on that. Um, and Tam says his nose looks a little deformed. Um, and so this is, as I said, some of these are just hard to do when you're not in person and can't get right up close to the painting. Um, but this person in, in their real life had frontal bossing, a saddle nose, um, a protuberant mandible and a short maxilla. Okay, any other questions or thoughts before we move on? All right, this painting is called Young Sick Bacchus. What do you see? What's going on in this picture? Cirrhosis, fruit, exclamation point. Love it. Erica, can I call on you? Um, what makes you say cirrhosis? Um, so I think the skin is jaundiced, um, but traditionally Bacchus is uh, related to the Roman and Greek gods of wine. So presumably additional alcohol components as well. Yes. Um, Classic. I love it. That's my, like one of my pearls for later, but yes, you're right. Bacchus is the god of fornication and wine. Um, but Hillary mentions my cirrhosis patients don't have muscles like that. Do you want to expand? Oh, I was just thinking that my cirrhosis patients don't want to waste it. Yeah. So what are you what what are you seeing in this patient in this um, painting uh, that is inconsistent with possibly cirrhosis? <laughs> well, he is a god. I like it. You guys are. Shree says, looks so young, absolutely. What if I told you that this is a, yeah, it would say looks like acute hepatitis rather than cirrhosis. Yeah, this is a self-portrait done by Caravaggio um, by looking in a mirror. Um, and in, uh, I'm getting distracted by the chat. Hillary says, does he have uremic frost or something right around the lips? I will say Hillary that um, in real life, the lips actually look a little bit more blue, but the photos online that show kind of the blue lips um, are really poor quality. So I wasn't able to get that, but um, that's a really excellent catch. Um, so Caravaggio, the, the subject and painter of this portrait uh, spent a good amount of time in the hospital when he was young and it was thought that he suffered from malaria So looking here, we have jaundice, conjunctival icterus. Um, so there's a thought that this represents like hemolysis and hyperbilirubinemia. Yeah. Um, at some point I was reading about this painting that somebody was positing Addison's disease, be but I, I would love to crowdsource whether people think they see acanthosis nigricans or anything resembling that in this paint painting. I think it could also just be a function of the, the quality of the picture I have here for you. All right, next, this is Virgin and Sleeping Child. What's going on in this picture? Ah, yes, you guys are seeing it, goiter her neck, wide set eyes, flat nasal bridge. Yeah, what else do you see? I think we're like getting like tuned right into the thing that may be wrong. Hillary says baby has congenital hyper hypothyroid question <laughs> mark. Nick, you are possibly correct. This baby is flipping us off. Mom looks sad. She looks cold and bundled up. Yeah, absolutely. 
What about even just the goiter that you guys have identified um, can give you information about what is or is not like the pathology for this person? I'll just move ahead. And put into words what we're seeing. So we're seeing, you know, fullness in the anterior neck and jumping to goiter, but really the differential for this could be very broad. I see Nick says, is this iodine deficiency style? I don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly could be. What would you be looking for for iodine deficiency? Yeah. All right. I think. Yeah. I Duncan says he has that question and no idea how to differentiate it. I don't have the answer to that. Um, some of the questions I asked myself when I looked at this is like, you know, this the skin is smooth. There's no like big nodules that are visible. It looks like smooth enlargement of the thyroid. Am I seeing any signs that this could represent Graves' disease? What would you be looking for in that case? I don't see any, you know, proptosis, sweating thinning of the hair. In the interest of time, I'll move us on. Um, this is another quite famous portrait. It's called Christina's World. I don't know if anybody here has seen it. What is going on in this picture? Hillary says she looks skeletal. Yeah. Christian, she's either lounging or fell. Yeah, even just backing up, this is a, you know, young woman in a grassy field far away from home and trying to get back, as Shree says. Absolutely. John Cho says mobility problem. Hillary says thinning hair. Absolutely. What about her hands? Does anybody have observations about her hands? What if I showed you this? Her hands look perhaps even more skeletal than the rest of her body. Shree says hammer toes. Sure. This is a young woman. Her name is Christina. She is the neighbor of the painter, um, Andrew Wyeth. And she had, yeah, congenital neuromuscular disease. Absolutely. She had charcot Marie tooth and ultimately was paralyzed from the waist down and moved around her farm by crawling. And so I think you guys hit the nail on the head with just saying that, you know, she's incredibly, has incredible atrophy. I would say looking at her hands, and I've looked at these paintings a lot in putting together this talk, um, you know, you can see quite a deformity there that then is, is typical of charcot Marie Tooth. Nick says this painting is intense. And I would agree, it, and it, I think the world at large would agree with you because it has been discussed ad nauseum um, in the art world and even in the medical world. It's, it's a quite popular one. Um, the lovely thing that I wanted to share about this painting is that the artist said um, he intended with this portrait to depict that her world may be limited physically, but by no means spiritually. And it's um, inspired by a time when he saw her crawling around her for farm to pick blueberries, which I just think is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to move us ahead a little bit, make sure that we're not missing out on time. Um, so here we have a portrait, it's called The Inspection, and it is one in a series of um, satirical 
portrait paintings um, depicting arist aristocrats and their marriages. What's going on in this picture? Talisha says child. Okay, there's two couples. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the child bride lady looks kind of embarrassed about whatever this other guy is doing. And he's like, I can't tell what he's holding. It's like, yeah. I don't know. It, yep. It's like a little skull or a little acorn or something creepy. Yeah. I love it. So <laughs> Nick says, Nick Bedore says casual human skull on the table, which I love. Um, but Talisha and Nick Joes are saying, like, maybe these are two couples. This is a couple, and this is a couple with a child bride. Does anybody interpret this differently? It looks like a coin, yeah. I suppose when I saw this painting, um, and perhaps I have more context, I interpreted this as a primary couple and possibly this as their child. An example of ambiguity. And Hillary is noticing the big moles on their faces slash necks. So what if we zoom in some lesions on their face and neck? With that time, I wonder about syphilis. And Nick says, possibly this is a painting of sex workers. You're absolutely right. So um, at this time in the 18th century, uh, one in five Londoners had syphilis by the age of 35. So this is thought to represent primary syphilis um, here. And this is a, um, like medical, a photograph of primary syphilis. Um, interestingly, I did include a picture here at the bottom of cutaneous anthrax because I think we don't know for sure. And they look, the lesions look really quite similar. Uh, Nick Bador says, what is the machine with the book on it? I don't know. I have no idea, but I appreciate you asking us to look over here in the corner and not just focus only on the people in the portrait. So thanks for that. Okay, here's one. This is um, what's going on in this picture. Yeah. It looks like a wedding. Yeah, marriage. This is the title of this painting is The Engagement of Virgin Mary. So you guys are spot on. And because we are looking at medical things and we're trying to move along, let's zoom in. What do you see here? Is that a cat's tail? Oh, uh, Nick, can you tell me what you're looking at? Like the gray sock looking thing looks kind yeah. of like the cat's <laughs> tail is poking out. I love it. I love it. I don't know the answer to that. Everybody seems to be um, focusing on this, which is obviously the point of the exercise. Um, and this is another area for ambiguity. We don't know what this represents. Here are two possibilities. One is an extra toe, so either polydactyly or syndactyly. This is an uh, example of um, a bunionette or a tailor's bunion, which is so named because tailors used to sit cross-legged all day with the outer sides of their feet rubbing against the ground. Fun fact for you there. Um, it's also postulated that this could represent um, gout, which was a very common Renaissance disease. And I see we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I am going to pick and choose the last of the artwork. Um, here is a painting, very, very famous. What's going on in this picture?
an experiment, says Seth. Nick says bird death, bell jar experiment. Absolutely, this is called an experiment on a bird in the air pump. And I'll be honest, I have no idea what experiment they're running on this bird. For myself, I noticed that these characters look distressed and possibly this person is doing some reassurance. Are they teaching them about oxygen? Your guess is as good as mine. Crazy hair scientist in the robe. Yeah, classic, classic crazy scientist in the center there. Big drink in the foreground. Does not look like something I would want to drink. I'm just gonna say that. Shri is wondering what the person by the window is doing. I'm wondering whether they're holding this thing and if this is a cage or if they're responsible for like the window and the light. Mindy says full moon. Nick says all the women are looking away or distressed. Yeah, interesting. And in an effort to like stay medical, let's zoom in a little bit and look in particular at this character. Tell me what you see. Nick says pink finger. Which finger are you looking at? Index. So this one here. Yeah. Nick says rosacea. Absolutely. What if I showed you this? Hillary says dermatomyositis. Yeah, so this is another painting that I don't think we have a perfect answer for, um, but has been widely speculated and written about um, that this here, which is better seen in person, um, you have your violaceous, you know, erythematous eruption over the dorsum of the knuckles, Gautron's papules, pathognomonic for dermatomyositis, and then your heliotrope rash slash, you know, face, facial rash. I love it. Okay. Shri, thanks Shri. Um, I wanted to spend a few minutes putting our new skills to the test. And I also wanna say that there's more paintings in my slide set. I wasn't sure how much back and forth we'd have. So please feel free to look through them at a later date. Um, but I have some still photos of patient hospital rooms, and I wanted to see if we can put these skills to the test in, a, in our context. So what can we say about this patient just from looking at their room without any information from the chart or even talking to them? What do you see? <laughs> Hillary says UWMC. Absolutely. I'm going to just warn you that all of these are acute care UWMC patients because that is where I happen to be. Victoria and Mike are saying chest tube. Many people are saying chest tube. Yes. IV bags, but not on O2, but does have a chest tube. Yeah. Wearing a GPS watch. Yeah, and you can't see it, but looking like if you looked closely, he has um, like fancy earbuds as well. <laughs> uh, looking very longingly out of the window, sense of loss. This is a young person. He has food in his cooler, lunchbox, his own water bottle. I would say like even the things on the table can be really helpful to me, right? There's a urinal there, so he's probably not walking to go to the toilet. Um, there's an emesis bag, so possibly this patient is nauseated. This is an incentive spirometer. I love it, Francisco. He's definitely rocking the like sweatpants and gown. Yeah, this is a patient who came in with a uh, left paranomonic effusion. 
now has a train and is planning for a vat. Um, I believe that is a lunchbox near the bed, Francisco. I did not ask what was in it though when I was in the room. Let's look at this patient. What do you see? Pink, lots of pink. PCA. I got the, like the perfect snapshot as this patient used their PCA. Thank you for sharing. The pants plus gown look reminds me how exposing gowns are and vulnerable it can make people feel. I would even go further to say that this patient has a lot of things from home. They have their own pillow. Hillary says her hair looks expensively highlighted. Francisco says feet look swollen. Mindy asks if she's DNR and I can tell you that this says DNR okay to intubate. There's balloons in the back, yes, Francisco. I had to crop them. Kim says maybe this is somebody who's in the hospital a lot. Yeah, absolutely. On the back side of her bed um, was like all of the stuff she brought from home. This is somebody with a breast cancer with significant um, metastatic disease who's here for radiation and pain control. Okay, I have just a few more. I hope we don't go over time. What about, what can we learn about this patient? Snazzy Walker, love it. Tube feeds, where are those tube feeds going, Hillary? Everybody's saying that this person looks cachectic and wasted, but has swollen legs and maybe edema. Vitals are normal. Someone wants them on telly. Hillary says, Peg, yeah, I think it's, it, it's possibly hard to see on your screens. Um, but this person is on oxygen. They have tube feeds running, but if you follow it, it's going here. So they're not getting NG tubes, they're getting Peg tube feeds. Um, his wife and I conspired to trick you. This is a candy bar that is only found in Canada. This patient is Canadian. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I think we have enough time for one more patient. What do we see here? Up in the chair, yes. I began GGT, GTT, love it. DNR, DNI, CPAP in the back. Thanks, Mindy. Might be the backward gown for going on walks with his IV tower, no blanket. There's a urinal in the back here, partially filled. I don't know how light that urine is. It's okay, I think. Using nasal cannula. Someone tracking INOs. Is someone tracking? We'll get there. This here, PCA. Yeah. Someone about him, something about him being so upright, oxygen and plethoric looking neck think, makes me think heart failure slash pulmonary edema. You guys are so, so good. What if I showed you their whiteboard? Use all the tools at your disposal. Were we right? Yeah, I think we pretty much got all of it. This is somebody who um, is on a dilated PCA, has a, um, yeah, this was just yesterday. I went around and did a tour to U UW. Um, this is somebody who's getting diuresed, has a lot of acute back pain, low sodium, two liter fluid restriction. 
Hillary, perfect segue into my take home points, which is that um, I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's easy to miss things that you don't expect to see. And the more you look, the more you will see. Um, and I think we underestimate how much we observe and synthesize as just part of our daily patient interactions and clinical decision making. So hopefully this talk demonstrated that it's a really valuable addition to our clinical practice. And um, as seniors, maybe we can intentionally name it and teach it to our interns and med students. Um, and um, it's okay to disrupt our everyday learning uh, activities for things that enrich our, ourselves and sometimes gorillas are invisible. I'm one minute over, I apologize, but special thanks to doctors Sarah Steinkruger, Dan Santavasi, Linda, Cam, and Kayla, and all of the patient models who agreed to have their photo taken. Jen, this was such a blast. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I appreciate your um, participation. It is a Zoom experiment that I wasn't sure which way it would go. <laughs>